So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is David Hume. I'm director of the Roslyn Institute and your compere for this evening. Uh, so we're, this is the uh, Our Changing World lecture series organized by the University of Edinburgh. It's in its fifth year. Public engagement is a major part of what the University of Edinburgh does and so this is the opportunity we have to get some of our people who sit in the proverbial ivory towers actually out into the open where you can throw things at them and ask them questions. Uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome particularly all, I gather there are some students, high school students here. Any high school students here? Nobody? Don't all speak at once? No? Uh, well, there are certainly many students here, but anyway, uh, everybody is welcome and I'm sure you'll have an enjoyable, uh, enjoyable evening. Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, one of the staff at the Roslyn Institute, David Galley. Uh, he's a graduate in microbiology from Newcastle University uh, and uh, did his PhD on cell wall assembly in bacillus. He then did postgraduate studies in Michigan, uh, went back to Newcastle for a while, then took up a lectureship in the University of Edinburgh Vet School in 1998 and became a professor of microbial genomics in 2006. And moved to the Roslyn Institute where he's a convener of one of our uh, uh, strategic programs funded by the BBSRC. Uh, David is fascinated by uh, Escherichia coli, which many of you will know uh, you produce in large amounts from your rear ends every day, uh, but somebody's got to work on them. Uh, he's particularly interested in the way that different strains cause infections in humans and animals. Uh, the majority of what he works on is the evolution underlying the emergence of new strains. So E. coli is not just one organism. In fact, it's a suite of related organisms. He's interested in ways to prevent bacterial infections, uh, including vaccines and small inhibitors. Uh, he says that he cares a great deal too much about E. coli, but when he's not worried about E. coli, uh, we see him dressed up in Go Faster stripes going around the town on his bicycle. Um, he might tell you a little bit about that as well. Uh, the business of antibiotic resistance is a pretty serious one and I think it's hard to escape it in the news. Uh, many of you uh, will hopefully not face that uh, concern, uh, but we have uh, the University of Ed oh, the, sorry, the uh, Royal Infirmary is actually the leading centre of sepsis uh, in Scotland in the sense of the number of patients that it actually has to treat in intensive care. Uh, that challenge is increasing greatly and uh, some of the work that we do in Roslyn we're interested in the transmission of antibiotic resistant organisms from humans uh, to chickens to cattle even to rabbits and then back to humans uh, so we share uh, bacteria with other animals and David I'm sure is going to tell us about exactly how we share them and why we should be worried and with a little bit of luck uh, give us some kind of hope for the future so thank you David. Thank you, Dave, very much for the uh, <coughs> introduction. And I certainly am poking out for my ivory tower. I'm not used to speaking to uh, 300 people uh, and being filmed. Uh, but it's a good opportunity to um, speak about a very important uh, topic. Right, so uh, the title is How to Survive in the Antibiotic Resistance Era. Um, that was suggested by my anchor. Actually, my background is as a, of, uh, as a microbiologist. Uh, and I'm focused on... Um, uh, gene exchange uh, between bacteria and gene expression in bacteria. And I'm going to wheedle that into the talk at, at, at various parts. So there'll be some basic teaching um, in here as well. Now, first off, I hope this is going to work. OK. So this is uh, Anne Miller, um, who died one year after I became uh, a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. She died stateside in Connecticut, age 90. Uh, she had three sons. At the time, six grandchildren and uh, seven great-grandchildren. Um, now, uh, approximately 60 years um, earlier, she was near death uh, in 1942, in February, um, near death in New Haven uh, Hospital, in bed, suffering from a very high uh, temperature, with this organism, shown in purple here, growing rapidly in her bloodstream. This is Streptococcus, and uh, she'd actually 
had this infection uh, for a, a, a number of weeks. She'd already lost um, the fourth child uh, that she was carrying due to this sepsis. Um, and this is the streptococcus blown up here shown uh, on the right-hand side. So she was suffering this, from this bacterial blood-borne uh, infection. The doctors um, treating her were frantic. They didn't know what they could do. They'd already tried several blood transfusions, uh, and those had failed. Uh, she'd already had a hysterectomy um, as a consequence of the infection. And what's shown here, and I hope you can just about make, make this out, this is her actual hospital chart um, from her time at New Haven Hospital. And this is her temperature shown up here. So you've got the normal temperature, which should be about here. And you can see for these are the days, this whole period of time she's suffering from a very high temperature, sometimes up to 106 degrees. Now, it turns out um, that the doctor treating her happened to know that, um, uh, I think it was Howard, um, I got the, yeah, George Fulton, um, who was in another bed in the, in the same ward, knew a chap called Howard Flory and uh, was aware of this, of a, of a compound that they were working on that they'd, they'd heard a lot about in terms of experimental studies. And so um, Howard Fulton was able to get some of this compound uh, shipped over to the hospital. In fact, um, only about 10 grams of this had been made by the company that, was, that Howard Flory was working with at the time, Merck, um, and they managed to supply half of that total supply of this compound um, to, uh, to the hospital to test on this patient. Um, this compound was penicillin, and um, they had no idea how much to give her. Um, the 5.5 grams was used in two injections um, overnight on the 14th of uh, March. And literally overnight, you can see that her temperature dropped from 106 degrees back down to um, an ordinary level. And within a few days, um, she was eating again, and she was uh, fully recovered within a week or so. Um, there was a, one of the interns in the hospital was charged with collecting her urine after being given uh, the penicillin, and they were actually able to recover. So precious was it, they were actually able to recover 70% of it uh, from her urine to, to use again. So, um, of course, you'll all be aware of the, of, of the penicillin story, and of course, um, Fleming, at the time, a Scot successfully working in London, um, as a microbiologist, the observation that he had, shown here on the right, uh, this is Staphylococcus aureus growing on an agar plate, and he'd left his plates while he, I think he went away on holiday, came back and the fungus was happily growing on the plate. <coughs> and he observed around where the fungus was growing, the bacteria were not. But it still took um, another uh, 15 or so years um, and uh, Florian Chain's work uh, in order to really identify and purify that molecule. <coughs> for which they all received the uh, Nobel Prize. Now, since then, uh, penicillin is estimated to have saved the lives of between 50 and 100 million people. And the point that I want to get across at the beginning of this talk is that that really, if we go back, this is over the lifetime of one person. This 60-year window that we've been living in for discovery of not just penicillin but other antibiotics has been a bit of a respite in terms of the scourge of many bacterial diseases on both humans um, and animals. Because I want now to jump forward um, to this case here, a chap called Brian Poole, 2013. Um, so he suffered a brain hemorrhage and was operated on in the Vietnamese hospital. Uh, he was then evacuated to Wellington Hospital, where he was identified as having a strain of Klebsiella, another bacteria here shown with a nice capsule. And at the time, the clinician, clinical microbiologist working on it said nothing would touch it. Absolutely nothing. It's the first one that we've ever seen that's resistant to every single antibiotic known. So it is the regular and often unrestricted use of antibiotics that has come at a heavy cost, as we now face an era in which many of these bacteria are now resistant to multiple combinations of antibiotics. And some bacterial infections now exist for which there is no treatment. 
And it's a statement from Professor Dame Sally Davis, the Chief Medical Officer in England, that antimicrobial resistance poses a catastrophic threat. If we don't act now, any one of us could go into hospital in 20 years for minor surgery and die because of an ordinary infection that can't be treated by antibiotics. And routine operations like hip replacements or organ transplants could be deadly because of the risk <coughs> of infection. Okay, so what I'd like to do in this talk is cover sort of three main areas. What is the threat and the current scale? Um, just introduce some infectious disease statistics and reports from uh, WHO and the CDC. I then like to use excuse to talk about some bacterial genetics, about mechanisms of bacterial resistance, how resistance is acquired by bacteria, and the, and the drivers of why we're seeing so much antibiotic resistance. And then touch on what can be done about this. Uh, stewardship and social issues. And then particularly focus on uh, technological advances um, that will enable more rapid diagnosis and more prudent use of antibiotics in the future. And also at the end have a couple of slides on uh, new and revisited methods for um, treating bacterial infections. <coughs> okay, so... Um, this is a fairly amazing slide I managed to find in my uh, wanderings on the internet. This is how human beings have died in the 20th century. And it's a, a fairly amazing piece of work uh, in terms of a number of algorithms had to be used to actually work back to make predictions on, on numbers because, of course, getting these things, um, uh, the actual accurate figures are very difficult indeed. Um, so basically, when we're not busy killing ourselves with food, or unregulated cell growth, um, cigarettes, cars, and wars, then infectious diseases are a predominant way in which we meet an early demise. And I suppose that's the important point here, focusing on preventable diseases. And a lot of, you could argue, <coughs> all infectious diseases are preventable diseases. And so in terms of the total burden in the 20th century of infectious disease deaths, if you go around this circle, there are a lot of viruses, the virus-associated diseases on there. Okay, so um, if we're dealing with here measles, um, some smallpox, uh, a good proportion of the respiratory, although there are a lot of bacterial infections in there as well. But also to make the point, the bacterial infections are very key in here. Tuberculosis, tetanus, a lot of the respiratory ones, especially pneumonia. Um, and, of course, a lot of the diarrhea-associated uh, uh, disease as well. So a significant burden in terms of uh, human uh, death and disease, so mor morbidity as well. Um, and that's really not beginning the discussion with, with animals as well. Um, I've stolen this nice slide uh, from the University of, of Düsseldorf. hope they don't mind, but it really shows again over the... Uh, lifetime that I was referring to from the 1930s with sulfonamides um, through to the present day, um, how we have the introduction of different types of antibiotics, and then really, as the majority of these are natural compounds, the resistances are already there. So the genetic basis to resistance for the majority of these is, is already present. Um, and so it's not surprising that we see in the green boxes here the resistances emerge on a very similar time scale over uh, very, very quickly uh, after the use, uh, the clinical use of a lot of these antibiotics. So um, taking current statistics from uh, the World Health Organization um, in terms of where they can collect data, it's estimated that for um, the European Union, um, there are attributed 25,000 deaths a year due to antibiotic resistant organisms with an extra 2.5 million extra days um, in hospital at a cost of around 1 billion. Uh, in the US, 20, greater than 23,000 deaths um, and, uh, and uh, 2 million illnesses. And the costs here are even higher. Uh, and Thailand in the middle here, um, obviously a smaller population, but a very high number of, of deaths and, and, and morbidity and hospital days associated. So this is a, uh, 
a global issue with a massive global impact in terms of um, mortality and morbidity. And just to bring that point home as well, this is, again, WHO statistics showing in dark green uh, where there's the isolation of um, combinate well, organisms where there's combinations of particular drug resistances. And you can see um, five or more of these combinations of nine that they're looking for are found all over the globe. And generally, where it's coloured in white, it's just because the collection of information is actually not, um, actually not occurring or there, there just isn't the, um, there isn't the monitoring and the surveillance going on. So a key point to make is this isn't just the scaremongering idea that you might have a cut and that's simple infection you might die of because it can't be treated. This is also impacting on a lot of the more sophisticated treatments that we have available to us. So anything that really requires immune suppression, under those conditions the bacteria can step in and cause serious systemic uh, infections. And that occurs during transplants where we have to suppress immunity to prevent rejection. It occurs during cancer treatments as well. So all of these things become much more dangerous uh, when you are unable to treat the bacteria that might step in and cause these infections. And also what's happening um, is that we're using antibiotics that were kept as those of the last resort. So they've got the first line, second line. Um, so things like the carbapenems, they were kept in reserve, um, you know, last resort. But unfortunately, as we're failing to treat with other antibiotics, these are having to be used more and more. And as that happens as well, we're seeing emergence of resistance to these last resort <coughs> antibiotics. So the Centre for Disease Control in the States produced a fantastic report uh, last year, which I encourage you to read if you're interested in this area, which hopefully you all are, we're here. Um, and just a quote from this, really, that, I mean, the example with Anne Miller was where she was given five grams of penicillin. Now, unless you're allergic, which is very rare, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing miracle substance. It's not toxic in any way to us. The trouble is, a lot of the other antibiotics that are available, the uh, further down the road ones, are actually more toxic. Um, and they're often more expensive and less effective. Um, so as a consequence of this, as we're treating more and more resistant bacteria, um, in fact, there's higher mortality, so the um, patient is more likely to die. There are longer hospital stays um, and potentially longer-term disabilities, all associated with these, hence the <coughs> threat report. Okay, so unfortunately that's not where the uh, problems end either. Um, we have another organism, which we're quite fond of in Scotland, unfortunately, um, which is Clostridium difficile, always a good one to pronounce. I think difficulty sometimes on the, on the news. Um, and this is a, an organism that flares up, particularly under antibiotic treatment. So it takes advantage of the fact that the normal flora in our gastrointestinal tract has been knocked down by the use of antibiotics. And unfortunately, it can produce particular toxins that can damage the intestine and result in, in very severe damage to the gastrointestinal tract and sometimes lethal infections. And in fact, in the States alone, it's estimated that Clostridium difficile infections are responsible yearly for 14,000 deaths and about 250,000 illnesses. And a lot of these arise from antibiotic uh, use, particularly in hospital settings. Um, the more general point, and I, there was a wonderful Horizon program on, I don't know if any of you saw it about a month ago, looking at how um, a reduction in the complexity of the bacterial flora that we are exposed to um, especially newborn children, so if you're born by caesarean, you're not getting exposed to bacteria present through the birth canal, um, lack of breastfeeding, reduce, re reduction in the exposure to particular bacteria, and very early antibiotic treatment, again, reducing the spectrum of bacteria you're exposed to very young. That's actually resulting in higher levels of allergies. Not exactly known what, what the basis to that is yet, whether it's because particular bacteria are modulating the... Um, uh, the development of the immune system, or whether we really need to see the antigen, the surface variation in factors 
presented by all these different bacteria. Uh, but there are important message about playing around with, mucking around with that important uh, establishment of our uh, major cell type <laughs> in the human body in the very early stages. Um, also, antibiotics are responsible for a lot of um, adverse drug reactions. 20% of all adverse uh, drug reactions that end up in uh, emergency admissions, and uh, that increases even more when it comes to uh, children. So there's a toxicity issue around a lot of these as well. Okay, so here's a sort of rogues list of some of the bacteria. Uh, some of these will be familiar to you. I've just mentioned Clostridium difficile. I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but I particularly want to mention methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, MRSA, which many of you uh, will, have, will have heard of on the news. Um, we have the emergence, well, we've had for some time now, uh, drug-resistant Neisseria gonorrhea, so sexually transmitted uh, bacterial disease. Um, we have the frightening spectra of uh, these carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteria ACA, which are very, very difficult to treat. And something I'm going to come back to in a couple of slides' time is drug-resistant uh, tuberculosis, a, a very serious uh, issue on, on the planet. So what are the drivers of this increase in the number of bacteria, the number of infections um, that are resistant to antibiotics? Well, the obvious one, or one obvious one, is the fact that we use them so routinely. So the stats available for the USA is almost working out at one prescription per person per year. Right? Now obviously that's not everyone receiving an antibiotic in, in the whole of the United States. Obviously reflects high usage in particular patients. But that's a, an amazing use of this precious uh, commodity. It's estimated that two-thirds of global uh, antibiotic sales occur without any uh, prescription. Perhaps more worryingly, and a, and a focus of where we're going with this talk, is that a lot of use of drugs, and in particular antibiotics, 90% of injectable ones, it's reckoned, are estimated to be unnecessary. So perhaps nine-tenths of the time, um, it's being used where it shouldn't be used. You've got the other issue that clinical settings, hospitals in particular, there's heavy use. So you then got, and I'll come to this in a minute, you then got the capacity for multi-drug resistant organisms to arise in those clinical settings. Um, often, particularly in developing countries, there is a supply issue. The options available are limited. The information on how to use and how long to use antibiotics is limited. Uh, and all of those things contribute uh, to the likelihood of emergence of resistant organisms. <coughs> So it is about distribution, fairness, quality, but information and education as well. So I just want to step to um, a map of tuberculosis infections for uh, 2012. Um, tuberculosis, as you'll be aware of, uh, um, particularly turn of the century, um, was a major, major killer uh, across the world. If you keep watching Who Do You Think You Are and you trace back family trees, there's always someone nobbled or multiple people nobbled by consumption uh, in, in all of those. A horrific, slow-growing um, uh, disease. And through uh, sanitation, through improved working and living conditions, and then through antibiotic treatments that came out in the 1940s, uh, rifampicin, amikacin, um, there was a considerable reduction um, in the, particularly in developed countries, in terms of uh, tuberculosis cases. Um, in 2012, there was an estimated 8.6 million cases of tuberculosis worldwide still. This is actually a reduction of 45% on a decade before. And the point I want to make here is that one of the reasons that TB has reared its head, one of the main reasons, is the co-infection uh, with HIV. And when, you're in, when your immune system is knocked down through infection with HIV, mycobacterium tuberculosis really likes that environment. It's much more able to then grow inside your macrophages and replicate without being killed. 
So a reduced immune system as a consequence of HIV infection is then really helping the emergence of uh, uh, increased levels of mycobacterium and tuberculosis. So about a, um, a third of the new cases are associated with HIV infection. So because of that, you then have an increased number of people that need to be treated for um, TB. Um, and often this is occurring in countries where access to uh, the complete course uh, of, of antibiotics is, is difficult. The standard treatment is generally a few months, anyway up to six months for ordinary uh, TB. And as a consequence, we now have an estimated... Uh, 450,000 people in 2012 uh, which have multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, uh, which is about 1 in 20 of the ordinary tuberculosis cases. Multi-drug resistant tuberculosis takes about two years to treat, and only about 3% of the people being treated actually uh, finish the treatment course, because it's such a complex and difficult treatment. The, the compounds are being used are those that were developed in the 1940s still, the majority. And they are toxic. There are many serious side effects, um, often vomiting. There could be effects on hearing, which make it very difficult um, to complete. And the really frightening spectra is that a proportion, I think it's just under 10% of MDR cases go on to be XDR, extremely drug resistant. Uh, now reported in 22 countries, um, worldwide, and generally 70% of people die within nine months of being diagnosed with having extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis. Um, there was a very, if you fancy a wee cry, and uh, a sorry, emotional hour and a half. This is an excellent um, documentary uh, focusing on Swaziland, uh, made by the BBC, which is available on uh, YouTube on XDR uh, TV. Okay, so that's an example with co-infection. Um, another place to lay the blame <laughs> is the use, potentially, this could discuss the point, the use of antibiotics in animals. Um, again, this is difficult information to get hold of, but um, back in 2009, it was estimated that something like 80% of the mass of antibiotics used in the United States was actually used in animals. Okay, so four-fifths of the tonnage, and that's how we're speaking now, the tonnage of antibiotics that are used, uh, were used uh, in animals. Yes, um, a lot of that is for growth promotion, and um, again, we don't fully understand exactly why that works, but it does. Um, and in Europe, what we've done is we've brought out legislation that's tried to restrict that by not allowing the use of antibiotics in animals for growth promotion. However, apparently it's very easy to sidestep. And in fact, there may, may be more antibiotics used now than there were before while growth promotion was going on. Because you just have to say that we've got X or Y and, and treatment is allowed on a clinical basis, which is perhaps even higher levels. So this is a very difficult uh, and emotive uh, area. And it's interesting to consider what other approaches we can use um, to perhaps stop these infections and Obviously, one could consider things like uh, vaccines and uh, the production systems that are, that are being used. So, again, to make an obvious point, I'm not going to focus too long on this slide, but bacteria are very good at getting around. Um, and if we just want out the bacteria rather than the genes at the moment, you've got the um, organisms present in animals, end up in water courses, usually can make their way back to us via those food and, and water routes. You've got hospital settings where there is the capacity to combine these to end up with multi-drug resistant uh, organisms. Not to mention the fact that, of course, we spend a lot of our time globetrotting. So globalization obviously gives us the capacity to transfer any of these from place X to, to place Y uh, very easily. I sometimes feel I'm being sterilized. You know those new scanners where you put your... Yeah, things at the airport, so I think it's actually sterilization at that point, just to make sure you're not bringing anything into the country. Um, anyway, so I'm going to switch um, for a second to 
uh, a bit of, bit of basic background um, on antibiotics and mechanisms of action, because I think this is necessary to understand the final third of the, the talk. Um, so here we have the different types of antibiotics. It's a grumpy antibiotic, but this is an antibiotic. Uh, and we've got some examples here underneath the antibiotic. Um, this is what the antibiotics affect. So these are important antibiotic uh, targets, okay? So these are things that bacteria express or have that your cells don't. That's the important bit. So the antibiotic can affect those, and there's um, generally no impact on your cells. So they've got to be things like the production of the cell wall, the surface of the bacteria, that's unique. And that's the beauty of uh, penicillins. But protein synthesis is another one. The, the ribosome, slightly different structure, different makeup, so different targets. So you can target protein synthesis. And the same with um, some of the replication machinery as well. So all these are great targets. So you start off with your smiley, happy bacteria, because life is good. And then you have the antibiotic meet the target. End of target, as far as that's what the antibiotic's doing. A very, very nervous bacterium by this stage. And then a very, very dead bacterium. And the reason bacteria die is because, for example, if you're targeting the cell wall, you get lysis. You release the contents of the bacterium. Or if you're targeting um, the DNA, it can't replicate. Um, or it can't transcribe. It can't express genes. Or can't produce particular proteins or essential growth factors. So this was the heyday, working on companies searching for these compounds which could inhibit essential ways uh, that the bacteria grow. However, bugs have an advantage that they generally can grow in the hundreds of thousands, millions. They have a, they have a complication as well. I always love this picture. This is one of, my, one of my favorite ones. This is an E. coli. So this is a millionth of a meter here. It's an E. coli that's just been lysed, and it's released the DNA that it contains. And it's having to replicate this DNA every 20 minutes or so. So it's got to actually work out how to do all that in the confines of, of this cell. Uh, and in fact, cells actually are replicating it even faster than that. Um, let's say there's 4 million base pairs, 4 to 5 million for E. coli. And it's got to replicate that every, every 20 minutes. And it can make mistakes. And it does make mistakes. They're pretty rare. Um, there are some bacteria that have deliberately selected the fact they don't repair their as, they don't repair their mistakes as often. So they actually deliberately create more mutations. Well, here's an example of one mutation. It's in um, a protein called DNA gyrase. Going back to this picture, gyrase is involved in helping wrap all of this stuff up, supercoil it up, shove it into the cells. So it's, it's, it's appropriately cared for. Um, now, gyrase is the target of ciprofloxacin in terms of an antibiotic. However, one single base change leading to a single amino acid change can mean this gyrase is no longer targeted by the antibiotic. So you can have evolution by mutation in terms of if you have enough bacteria and very rare events like this. But because you've got millions and millions of bacteria, you will occasionally get this, and you can select this out. But the power of numbers is important, the mutation. The other way that's very important in terms of evolution and resistance is the acquisition of new DNA. Some bacteria, but not all, are very promiscuous. They like acquiring DNA, add it to their collection. And there are different ways of doing that. Um, but you particularly will have heard of plasmids. And this on the right here is bacteriophages. So these are viruses of bacteria that can infect uh, bacteria. So if we look at the E. coli genome, if you just focus on the outer circle, all these red bits and these colored bits are bits of DNA that have come from the outside and been slotted into um, the genome over evolutionary time. So you've got this mosaic genome. And these carry factors that can be involved in perhaps now colonizing a different host. And some of these genes could encode antibiotic resistance markers. So you've got this plug and play genetics. So transformation, this is the basic way that bacteria can pick up naked DNA. Most of the time, if it finds naked DNA, it just eats it for lunch. 
and actually consumes it as a nutrient source. However, sometimes that DNA very rarely could be incorporated into the genome, or if it contains the relevant genes, could actually be uh, replicated as a plasmid. So that's transformation. Plasmids can be transferred between bacteria. So a bit of parental guidance on, on this one. Cover your eyes now. Um, so the bacteria that has this plasmid can actually pass it to this other um, organism by a process called conjugation. So it actually produces something called a sex pillus, uh, and this is as close as bacteria get to sex in terms of exchanging uh, genetic information. So this bacteria now has a copy of the plasmid this strain had to start with. And the third way involves these viruses of bacteria, bacteriophages, meaning eating of bacteria. And here you have a phage that can land on the surface of a bacteria, inject DNA. Sometimes that DNA can be integrated into the genome of the bacterium. That then leads to often the replication of multiple phages within the bacteria, lysis, release of lots of new virus, and so the cycle continues. Now occasionally, when you're building these phages, you chop up this DNA to make new phage particles. You have to replicate the phage DNA inside the bacteria, using the bacteria as a factory. But occasionally you can actually put the wrong DNA into the virus head. It's called faulty head stuffing, which is probably what I'm doing to you now, um, providing you with the wrong information. However, it works brilliantly as a delivery vehicle at that point. It's now got random bacterial DNA in this head, and it can go on and inject that into another bacteria. So that transduction event, again, could be quite rare, but when we're dealing with the melting pot of somewhere like a gastrointestinal tract or in the soil or wherever, this is enough to convey a lot of transfer of different genes between bacteria, depending on these viruses. Okay, so, oh yeah, <laughs> I dug up one uh, example. Uh, Belgian toilets from the 1300s. This is a strange article, but managed to find some bacteriophages from those samples, managed to sequence genetic information in those bacteriophages from all that time ago, and actually found resistance gene present in those bacteriophages back then. So they've been hopping these things around for, for some time, way before us. So simplistically, I always like to show these cartoons because I think they work well. Um, we start off with our bacterium A, has a toolkit, has a certain set of genes that produce factors that are important for the survival of the bacteria. And that's shown by the toolkit that's got around its waist. It can meet another bacterium, bug 2, which has got a different toolkit. And the point is these genetic exchange mechanisms allow the transfer of factors. And in this case, antibiotic resistance markers. Um, and that can generate superbugs that we've all heard of. So um, it's this capacity to exchange information uh, which is really important and useful for the bacteria. So we have a project, little project, going on um, at the vet school, which is looking at multi-drug resistant E. coli, uh, responsible for infections uh, in dogs. And we recently sequenced um, these, uh, some of these strains. And um, we know they're multidrug resistant, resistant to various different antibiotics. And lo and behold, when we've sequenced a number of them, we find that in addition to the chromosomal DNA, they've got multiple plasmids, many of them up to five different plasmids. It's 500,000 base pairs of extra information in a four million base pair organism sometimes. And each one of, well, of three, at least three of these contain an individual antibiotic resistance gene. Loads of other information as well, and we don't know the context of, of what that's doing. But so the obvious thing here is, it seems to be, that these are cases where the animal's being treated with one thing, then treated with another, then treated with another. And sequentially, like a going around shopping, saying, yep, I'll have one of those, I'll have one of those, I'll have one of those, the organism is picking up these different plasmids that allow resistance to the different antibiotics. So what are these resistances? Well, um, I watched a TED lecture on this. I couldn't resist. You know, give these 20-minute TED lectures. Uh, he called this the upchuck, um, which I thought was quite good. American, but you know. Um, so here's our, uh, here's our bacterium. 
the antibiotics have gone in, and it has the capacity to pump them back out again. So you can get genes which are involved in efflux pumps, pumps that kick out various toxic compounds as far as the bacteria is concerned, including antibiotics. So that's one way the bacteria can become resistant. In other ways, they can acquire genes that modify. They change the antibiotics. So they add some chemical to it. So it doesn't work anymore quite as well as it did. So it's a, it's a nicer antibiotic. It doesn't get around to killing uh, the bacteria. Another way, a little more subtle, not, um, is to cleave, break up, cut up uh, the antibiotic. Another way is if you remember... We've got these important factors that the bacteria has. Well, they can be hidden from the antibiotic. So you can change their appearance so they can't be spotted by the antibiotic. And then the final way is to stop the antibiotic getting into the cell to make it impervious. Put a Macintosh on and have an umbrella. So you've got reduced permeability. So the key point here is you've got all these different mechanisms Many of them are sets of genes or individual genes, and they can be effectively transferred uh, between bacteria. So bacteria can acquire these, but they can also often lose them. And that's an important point. And I think there is hope in, in that knowledge as well. So um, the way forward for the final part of the lecture. Um, so rather than reinventing the wheel here, I... Uh, borrowed from a, a brand new report, uh, which is from the President, USA President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Uh, so Obama's just received this in the last few weeks, apparently. So it's hot off the press to you. Um, so we've got a number of points here. The first one is to improve surveillance. We've, we've got to know what's out there. We've got to know exactly what we're dealing with. Okay, and that goes from the microscale of knowing what an individual patient's got through to what's present in the ward, what's present in the environment, what's present in towns, cities, countries. And I'll come to how we can do that in a minute. But that will enable an effective response. It'll stop outbreaks, limit the spread, and allow appropriate infection control. Also, couple number two, is to try and increase the longevity of our current antibiotics. So hopefully going to convince you that, yes, while we do have resistance out there, appropriate use, prudent use. And this is already going on, particularly in a number of developed countries there, um, in terms of trying to look at ways that particular antibiotics can be cycled through and be very aware of, of trying to limit pres prescription. Um, so that the idea is, therefore, to prevent the spread of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, uh, scaling up proven interventions to decrease the rate at which microbes develop resistance to current antibiotics. And then the final point is, yes, there's been very limited uh, development of, of new classes of antibiotics over, over the last few decades. There are, though, a number of very specific uh, uh, compounds targeting particular bacteria which are in the pipeline, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. So we have things that can be developed in terms of new interventions for particular bacteria, and we also have to consider other interventions as well, uh, and again, I'll come to those uh, in the last few slides. Um, so, in terms of surveillance, we have to work out which, what we're dealing with, and we've got to do it quickly. So, are we dealing with not so bad, fairly bad, or pretty awful in terms of our bacteria? And as David introduced at the beginning, one key area, and it's an extreme area, is bacterial sepsis. So, this is when the bacteria have got into your bloodstream and are actually multiplying successfully in your bloodstream. Now, the immune system is engaged and it's seeing those cells and actually it's a combination of sometimes what the bacteria is producing in terms of toxins, but also the strong response to those bacteria that can kill you once the levels of, of bacteria get high enough. And the scary thing is some of these guys can replicate every 20 minutes. So you can be feeling fine uh, one minute, and you can be dead 24 hours later. So sepsis can often is, is a medical emergency often. I think the Anne Miller case was a bit of an exception where she'd had uh, this longer-term uh, infection. And the key point here is um, the actual patient survival rate is very dependent on 
rapid, uh, effective treatment. So the clinician's got to make a very quick decision, and usually based on no information, apart from the fact that the person's got a temperature and, and, and the history. So what goes on in terms of current bacteriology assessment or testing in terms of a, an ill patient? Um, so we have our person has an illness, a blood sample, for example, could be urine, uh, could be spinal fluid, could be feces is taken. And classically, we try and culture what's in that sample. We try and grow it up on an agar plate. Good stuff that's been going on for a good hundred years. It's good <coughs> microbiology. It's great if you can actually grow your bacteria up on a plate, have them there. And this plate here shows a different couple of colonies. You don't know which one's responsible for the disease. So often, you then have to grow things up a little bit longer. You have to put them onto a different medium, see if you can actually define what might be present. And there's some very nice colored plates that allow identification of particular organisms. So if you're lucky, if it's a quick growing organism, this may take a couple of days. And further on, there are various biochemical kits that you can put the bacteria into. And that can help identify things as well. So you might, if you're lucky within three days, have a pretty good idea of what your organism is. At the same time, you can take these bacteria and put them on a plate and try and see which antibiotics may kill them or may not kill them. And you can measure zones of clearance around different antibiotics that are, that are soaked in tissue paper. Um, so that allows you to have a, uh, an idea of, of what the organism is susceptible to. Now, um, one of the issues, and I, didn't, I just should have pointed it out back in Mrs. Miller's chart, is that there was bacterial broth cultures of her infection daily. And even though she's very likely to have had that streptococcal infection the whole time, there were several of those broth cultures that turned out negative. Um, and that's because you will fail to recover organisms some of the time, even when you've got uh, a standard infection. So not only is this a slow process, it often misses really what's going on. What's nice about it is you do end up with the organism uh, at, at the end of it. And of course, ideally at this point, you would actually prescribe, based on your knowledge of what's gone on here, what the patient should have received. But in cases of sepsis, this person's already dead. So this is not good. So this is basically what happens here is you just have to prescribe a broad spectrum in the hope that it's going to work. I'm no clinician. I'm a microbiologist. So I apologize if I'm oversimplifying. I know there are set out uh, ways to do this. But it's to make the point that the information is not there at the time to make the decision. So the obvious, um, oh, yeah. So where we're going with this in, in terms of now and ongoing is the rise of sequencing. And um, at the moment, the sequencing world is generally governed by big centers, big machines, with incredible power to sequence DNA molecules. I mean, uh, single uh, lanes or single samples where you're getting currently 300 to 5 million short read sequences. The next generation, something like 3 billion short reads. Um, phenomenal amount of information about what is in a sample. The aspiration is rather than having these big machines everywhere, is for this technology to scale down. And it will. It is happening. Um, various companies are already developing sort of almost plug-in chip-based uh, readers, including Oxford Nanopore. So the idea, hopefully, is to spread out the sequencing to all hospital centers in a, in a cheap, affordable manner. So what you'll then be able to do is take your sample, extract your DNA, RNA, so extraction of nucleic acids, really important in terms of the methodologies for that. And it's a very complicated issue within this whole process. But then gets fed into a sequencer, instantly out to bioinformatics software that can actually analyze that sequence. And from that sequence, we can understand what's present in that original sample. And that, therefore, can also include uh, the identification of particular genes that are present that give us certain resistances to antibiotics. Now, at the moment, especially if you're doing this at Edinburgh Genomics, 
might take you a few months to get all your samples back. So, um, but as the technology gets scaled down and gets faster, there's no reason why this can't occur within a few hours. And that's the aspiration. You take a sample, you extract the nucleic acid, you get the sequence back, and it's automatically fed into pipelines that can give us the information out. I'm going to come to the advantage of that in a, in, in, in a minute, but there is a, a real possible scale up here, which you cannot do by the growth methodology. There's, there's so long it takes to grow bacteria, and so the old school way is never, ever going to be as, as quick. So with this, there are various other types of advantages. So um, one is that you get to see what's actually in the sample. So in a lot of cases, you may not be growing anything. So you, you can't come to a conclusion. Well, here, you'll actually get to see what's in the sample, even if you can't grow it. So it might be that it was a fungal infection. It might be it was a combinatorial infection. There might be very, very low levels of things which you don't detect. Because of the huge numbers of reads, those should be detectable. So the complexity of the infection uh, should be um, open for all to see. If you start looking at the RNA, just let's focus on the pathogen at the moment, you can actually ask what it's up to. What's it expressing? Which factors does it decide to switch on while it's in the host? Incredible amount of information about what's going on in the patient. The hope is that we can then feed this sequence information into national and international databases. So this is going to require the next generation of bioinformaticians and the connectivity of that information. Um, but the national surveillance networks feeding into international surveillance. So this is really where the computing age can really link in with, um, with these particular uh, diagnostics. Now, um, I'm going to come to epidemiology in a minute about how we can trace infections. Uh, but that's obviously another really key point of this, is that the more we understand about the specifics of the bacteria causing the infection, the more we can trace it back, find out where else that organism or that set of genes has been uh, before. So the personalized medicine at, at the bottom here, um, from that same sample, it is possible to look at what the patient is doing in terms of its transcriptional response if you isolate particular cells, and you're looking at what's going on as a signature for specific types of infection. In fact, um, Peter Gazelle's work recently here at the University of Edinburgh, is very looking at neonatal sepsis and looking at signatures of responses to infections from blood samples. And you can get to the level of gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria by looking at those signatures. So you can actually get diagnostic information by looking at what the patient's doing. If you start to layer on the fact that really we should all have our genetic passport in a few years, we should have our sequence. We should be aware of the uh, mutations that we have that mean we don't quite deal with infections as well as the person next to us because we've got a mutation in a particular gene. So we can take that information and layer that onto this. So that in some cases, for example, people are naturally immune suppressed because of particular mutations. Therefore, there would be the requirement to perhaps prescribe antibiotics earlier because we're aware that they have increased susceptibility. So that knowledge is not something to be scared of. It's something to be embraced. It can help treat and understand infections. And I know we worry about the ethics of what we and how we look after and how we handle that information. But from my perspective, we should embrace the fact that, that will allow us, in these cases, to actually understand and treat infections better. So... Recently in the literature, there's been an expansion of studying outbreaks and understanding, tracking bacteria over the world. And this is just uh, one example I've stolen from a PNAS paper um, published last year, which is looking at Shigella uh, sonii infection. And by sequencing the specific bacteria and actually looking at base changes, you can estimate rates of change and you can look at relationships accurately between the bacteria. And you can work out when the particular strain arrived in a particular city, and then when it's moved up, and you've had then microevolution in different cities. And you're following the time scale of the spread of this important uh, diarrhea-causing uh, bacterium. And in the same study, you can then focus down in Ho Chi Minh City and actually get the patient's addresses 
of, of where they're living and then looking at the different types of resistant bacteria that they, they have, the resistance you get, and the increase in the incidence of the resistant bacteria. And actually, the heat map here is of, um, is of diarrhea, but it's not known what the cause of the diarrhea is. But you can see how it sits really at the center of where the majority of people are with these strains of Shigella. So you can start to do this type of tracking at a city and international scale. Um, one other example, this is looking at uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus um, in a special care baby unit in Cambridge. And again, through the sequencing of the bacteria and the relationships and the accuracy with which you can say this bacterium is the same as this one, because it has an identical sequence, or it, it only changes by one single base, one SNP, you're actually able to look at transfer in the baby ward between mothers, between babies. And despite deep cleaning, they, were, they were still had an infection issue, and they didn't understand why, why that was. And it turned out that um, at least one of the workers in, um, in the ward was actually infected with the organism. And they were able to prove that. So all the ones in red here um, are uh, incidents of a, a worker being infected with that specific MRSA. So the information here uh, is incredibly detailed and allows the tracking, allows the epidemiology uh, to be carried out. So um, as I'm, I know all the students in the global course are aware of the Longitude Prize, I think you're discussing it <coughs> later this week. Um, we set up the problem, hopefully in this lecture. The challenge here is to create a cheap, accurate, rapid, and easy-to-use point-of-care test. Now, at the moment, sequencing, probably, by the time this award comes, is probably not going to manage that, although you can see how it can begin to do that if we get the technology down to the sort of chip level into the side of a computer. Um, perhaps this is going to have to work still on, on other methods to detect patient responses or bacterial responses to particular antibiotics done on a, on a micro scale. And I know there's various groups in Edinburgh that are trying to get together now to consider ways to, to tackle this challenge. But it's a kind of at the level above the, the high density um, diagnosis of, of the high throughput sequencing. But it's still a very, very important challenge because it still allows then the uh, treatment of people, at least for a bacterial infection, even at that level, just make sure at least they've got a bacterial infection that you're treating, rather than something that's, that's not going to be uh, effective in terms of the antibiotic. So this is an important problem, and it would be great to, to improve this. So the WHO have uh, obviously set surveillance as key to inform public health actions and strategies, and central to that uh, surveillance, I think, will be um, sequencing technologies. <coughs> okay, I've got three more slides to go. And these are on uh, stewardship and uh, novel treatment uh, methods. So, um, there is the thinking that if one could rotate the use of antibiotics, keep some in the cupboard, um, <laughs> in particular areas, regions, that perhaps that could lessen the resistance to, to those particular antibiotics over a period of time. And there are parallels that can be drawn here um, with uh, resistance to certain compounds in terms of malaria, obviously parasite infection. So in 1993, um, Malawi became the first country in Africa to replace chloroquine with a combination of uh, sulfoxidoxin and pyrimethamine for treating malaria. Yeah? Then the clinical efficacy of chloroquine was less than 50%. So it was not used. But by 2001, they were, they were failing to detect chloroquine resistance in the falciparum parasite. Okay? So it was no longer detectable. So because they hadn't been using it, it's now been shown that you can now go back and start treating uh, with chloroquine, and it's effective. So it proves that you can play with this balance. So therefore, the prudent use and perhaps scaling and uh, timetabling could be effective um, in that manner. One area that I'm keen on, and it's an interesting 
perhaps indictment of antibiotic use um, over the last uh, 40 or 50 years, perhaps maybe not so in the last 15 years, but I think an understanding of basic bacterial pathogenesis, how bacteria cause disease, was really hit by antibiotics. We don't need to understand how bacteria cause disease. We've got antibiotics. What do we need to know? We can kill them. And I think, I think that, that really did influence a lack of innovation and understanding of bacterial disease over two or three decades. Meanwhile, the virologists marched on and had a much better molecular understanding of their organisms. That's personal feeling. Um, but I think the error in that is that we can use that information, that understanding of exactly how bacteria replicate and multiply in animals and humans to target them effectively to prevent that disease. It's not necessarily about stopping them growing. What you're doing is stopping them causing pathology, stopping them releasing the toxin, stopping them binding, all things that can reduce disease. And so there's a whole world of small compounds out there that have been used to look at just killing bacteria. And these small molecules can now be used in screening programs to actually understand whether they can help switch off or block factors which are involved in the disease process. And so these antivirulents or pacification compounds, as I like to call them, there's a lot, a lot of studies now beginning to, to look at this. And examples have been shown, for example, with Pseudomonas, where they stop the bacteria talking to each other, which limits their capacity uh, to cause disease. So I think this is an exciting area. And certainly, it was an understanding of HIV virus life cycle in terms of how it binds to cells, how it replicates. Um, post uh, well, transcriptional and also protease activity as well. All these things can be blocked by different therapies which are effective in blocking HIV life cycle. And we have to get to that level with our understanding of bacterial disease. And then we can actually find these inhibitors. The, the final one, and this comes around, sort of wheeled out on a regular basis, but I think it, it really does fit with the bioinformatics issue, which I raised earlier, is the use of bacteriophages. So bacteria out there are constantly fighting viruses which bind to their surface, inject their DNA, replicate in the bacteria, burst out and kill the bacteria. So these are evolved nanomachines that target specific bacteria in a beautiful way. Right? Now, the trouble is, is that you take any two strains and the virus that manages to kill the bacteria is slightly different. And at the moment, we don't really understand why. But I think through using the sequencing of both the phages and the bacteria, we can create a checkerboard and actually say, yes, if you've got this sequence, you will be resistant to this, this, and this bacteriophage, but you will be susceptible to this, this, and this bacteriophage. We already have, thanks to the heroic early work of Felix Durrell, and then uh, the, uh, well, it's been renamed the Georgia Levia Institute, 50 years of collection of bacteriophages that target pathogenic bacteria. So there's a resource out there in terms of sequencing susceptible and resistant bacteria to these phages. The interesting thing about the phages is they often lose the capacity to infect the bacteria after very short periods of time. So there's a natural built-in safety valve. We can modify these phages. So once you get around to that level, you can actually put things into them to deliver into the bacteria as well. So I think there is a brave new world here with dealing with bacteriophages. I think it's really, really exciting. And there are several books on this. And it's certainly been used to treat infections in the past, infections that couldn't be treated with antibiotics. So I think bioinformatics is certainly a way into this. OK, a penultimate slide, apart from acknowledgments. Um, so in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, Fleming stated, the time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there is the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. So perhaps we, as the human race, have been ignorant and partly squandered this wonderful opportunity of some of these compounds. But I think... Hopefully, I've got across that we do have the tools and the technology to enlighten us about the evolving threat, about what is out there. And with that, we can have a more informed, prudent use of our current and future antimicrobials. And that if we do 
manage this, then we should have less carriage and less presence of resistance. Um, also, I'm convinced that the more we understand about the pathogens themselves, the more that we can go in, identify them specifically, and disarm them specifically in terms of reducing uh, the disease that they, they cause. Um, and in general, that leads to more successful outcomes, both for the patient and for society as a whole. And I would just <coughs> like to thank a few people, um, particularly Eliza Wolfson, who is an ex-PhD student now down at Cambridge for doing all the wonderful cartoons. And that's her website there, if anyone wants to look at all the other exciting artwork that she's done. And to a number of colleagues, Sam Wagner, Sally Argyle, Alex Corbett and Ross Fitzgerald for very helpful discussions on this topic. Uh, Yale, <laughs> Yale New Haven Hospital Archives for uh, supplying Anne Miller's hospital chart and a, a really informative article. And for the many people that I've pinched figures from and uh, hopefully acknowledge them all, but uh, I may have missed a few. Thank you.